this is the hour, Stephen Hour, and welcome back to another 007 movie review. And in today's series, we'll be looking at the 1971 film Diamonds Are Forever. Now, just before we get into it, of course, we need to go to a quick and brief background now about this film. But I also want to say this is one of my least favorite in the series, and it is also one of the least favorite amongst the Bond community. But here, let's get more further into the review. Now, first off, after not, after Honor Majesty's Secret Service, which is today considered one of the best Bond movies ever made, back in its time, it was not it was not that well received. Well, it was a big hit at the box office, but it didn't but it didn't gross as much money as compared to the Connery films. And of course, Lazen Bean, only doing one film, dropped out. And at this point, the filmmakers were scared for the future of the franchise. They had already cast a new actor for the role, but the big studio heads demanded Connery be brought back. And as a result, they Connery was given an unheard, a unheard of money to come back for this one film. Now, to be fair, he did, the money that he got from this film, his big paycheck, wasn't purely for you know, he didn't feel to just come back for the money. He would actually would use some of this to go to a Scottish educational fund. So he didn't come just back for dollar signs. He he did it for a good cause. And he also got a contract to do two other films with United Artists. But as far as I know, he's only did he's only done one film with them. With that, they wanted to make Diamonds Are Forever just as a big just as big and bad as Goldfinger. And it was essential and it was already a new decade. And they wanted to prove to the audience that Bond was not just a product of the 60s, it could exist far beyond the 60s. So as a result, they brought back every all the creative team from that did Goldfinger. They brought back director Guy Hamilton, and and already they wanted to do a sort of big and bad film. They thought this should be a will be even bigger blockbuster than Goldfinger. There was even early drafts in the script for the film to be the main villain to be Goldfinger's brother. But of course that was scrapped and Blofeld was the main villain. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's get on to the cast. The cast for the film is of course Connery returning in the role of James Bond. Although his performance here for me is mixed. I kind of don't know, can't really explain it. He, he certainly does look like he's having a bit more fun than he did in You Only Live Twice, but at the same time, he also has a bit, he's also slightly bored in some scenes, and he also looks like he has aged phenomenally, and it's only been like four years. So yeah, the big, and of course, uh, Blofeld again is back with Charles Gray playing Blofeld. I've got to be honest. I would always say that Charles Gray for me is probably one of the worst Blofelds, especially in the original film series. But I've looked at it now, and I can't exactly... And yes, he's still my least favorite Blofeld, but surprisingly, the performance has slowly grown on me. He's more campy, but at the same time, it's also just out of... Now, now the performance-wise is actually likable, I will admit, but I just thought that the actor was a terrible miscast, especially since he played an ally in the previous, in Connery's previous Bond film, so that just kind of just feels out of place for me. Here we have uh, Jill St. John as Tiffany Case. Now, I really like Tiffany Case, and I really like the actress's performance of it, and to be honest, she starts off really well, a smart, confident, you know, Bongo, and she does stay there for quite a while, but then at the end of the film she becomes a dwindling bimbo, which which ironically some Bong girls do tend to be, especially in the classic, you know, the classic era of making the whole Bond series. And I will admit the actress has definitely, you know, is the person who is a really likable person, especially in interviews about her doing the role. She's always, you know, was glad to be at least be a part of it you know, part of it, and she knew what she was getting into, and I've always liked that about her. The henchmen for this film are Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd. This being Mr. Wint, and this being uh, Mr. Kidd. Now, 
Um, uh, Peter Smith is uh, Mr. Kid is Mr. Kid and uh, Bruce Bruce Glover, father of Crispin Glover, plays Mr. Wynn. Now these two are pretty much, you know, basically are a henchman for the main villain and are essentially are a gay couple. That's essentially what they are, and I don't find it a bad offensive. I do like how they just, you know, they have this, like, they talk to each other. They're funny, they're silly, goofy, but they also do very mean and dark things, and I really like it, especially like it, and I just like the performance. It really lifts the film for me. Uh, we also have, um, Plenty O'Toole, a minor bong girl, played by Lana Wood. I can't believe I just said that. Uh, and basically, she's just a, mo a, a minor bong girl, but she surprisingly liked very fondly amongst the fan base. I can't see, but I can't really see why. I mean, she's, don't get me wrong, she's enjoyable, but that's all I found her, just a minor character. Another character I really like in this film, and is one of my favourites, is uh, Willard White, uh, portrayed um, by... <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, Willow White <clears throat> is portrayed by Jimmy Dean and essentially is this big American tycoon businessman. He has ventures in everything and is also has influential friends in the government. I like the performance. It's American, but he's surprisingly a likable character, even to Bond. And I must admit, this film does have some pretty cool likable characters. Plenty of tool. A Willow White, I'm definitely that, and even the main Bond henchman. But what let and it has a pretty decent Bond girl. But the film is for me is let down by its casting of the main villain. We also of course have the usual supporting characters. We've got M, Money Penny, and Q, played by Bernard Lee, Lois Maxwell, and uh, Desmond Llewellyn, all fine in their respected roles. We also here have uh, another minor character, uh, Peter Franks, who is betrayed, <coughs> uh, who is betrayed by Joe Robertson. Uh, we also here have some minor characters here with a uh, Blofeld, you know, crew, who turn out who are Bert, who is um Bert Saxby, who is betrayed by Bruce Cabot, and we have uh, Dr. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Metz, who is, excuse me, sorry my voice, it just feels very off today. Uh, Metz, uh, here Dr. Metz, who is Essentially, just a minor, vil uh, minor character, and, all and quite forgettable, and is portrayed by Joseph First. We also here have a comedian uh, character, uh, Shady Tree, portrayed by Leonard Barr, is that another person in the Blofeld operation, and we have yet another Felix Slider, very forgettable um, version of the character, portrayed by Norman Burton. And I just feel that he's just terribly miscast and is more bureaucratic. And Bond treats him almost like he would with Q. So I find that weird. And of course we have here a bunch of gangsters. And that and they are really fun and entertaining, I will admit. But they are just gangsters. Nothing more. This has this is also a very weird cast film, but eh. Okay, we'll get on with it, hey? The gun barrel, we kick off the film with the usual gun barrel. We're Sean Connery back in the gun barrel. And the film kicks off with Bond, assen Bond essentially interrogating three people to find Blofeld. And if you watch the films in order, you would assume that, oh, Bond's trying to find Blofeld for the death of his wife. And I assume that too. But I was in incredibly mistaken. As, again, something you need to know about this film we're getting into. If you think this is going to be a revenge story, it's not. 
it almost like it doesn't even acknowledge the events of on her majesty's and just picks up the film almost literally just after you only live twice i do like with connery it now back they sort of build up to actually seeing his face almost like his big re almost like his return which i kind of like but what ruins it for me is when he finally does his james bond line it's for some reason sped up and he doesn't and he look like he's aged considerably and he's no longer as charming as he was in his 60s films. After that, we then find that Blofeld has not just been in hiding, but he plans to make duplicates of himself. I find this weird. Why would you want to make duplicates of yourself when all you could do is just get yourself plastic surgery? And again, Blofeld here is portrayed by a different actor. Again, people find it weird, but in the books, Blofeld is a master of disguise. And I wish if that was just more addressed of why his face changes is because he's uh, changing his identity to just, uh, you know, get away from Bond. But the actor already played him on a character in a previous Bond film. It makes no sense. And it just seems lazy on the producers to cast him in the role. Nothing against Charles Gray, but I just find it weird that he was cast in the role. After that, we then find Bond sab finally catch up to Blofeld, but not before sabotaging an experiment uh sabotaging to uh have someone got go under the plastic surgery to essentially look different and it's a very poor way to do it and also weird and it turns out most of this was done because most of the budget for the film was actually went to connery for his salary so that just so as a result the production for this film will feel weird after that he finally has a confrontation with blofeld and kills him. And we get to the title sequence, where Shirley Bassey returning from Goldfinger to do the title song. It's all right, and it is okay, but it's nothing big as the goal the Goldfinger song was. And also the imagery just feels very weird for me. And you would, and yeah. I really wish that this film could have been more about Bond really getting revenge for the death of Tracy, but they refuse to acknowledge its image. It's almost like the film wants to start, if you didn't like Honor Majesties, well forget about it, we're just doing with Bond trying to track down Blofeld, or if you liked Honor Majesties, this is Bond getting some closure, but we are not going to explain it, we are not going to fully go into it, which for me I felt was just lazy and, and a completely missed opportunity. After the title sequence is over, we then kick off to the film where M and Bond are meeting with some bureaucrat, or at least some high member in the British government, about diamond smuggling. As it turns out that there's been some diamond smuggling going on, and that people are getting killed. And this is done by the two henchmen, Mr. Wit and Mr. Kid. And Bond has now got to intercept a guy named Peter Franks, take his identity, and essentially find out who's been smuggling the diamonds. I like how Bono is completely bored, doesn't want to be on this mission, saying that it is beneath him. You know, almost saying that it's not just beneath him, but it's just a simple matter. But Bond reminds him that the PM thinks differently, and now that Blofeld is dead. Finished. And they can expect better work from him. Almost like, and it's almost hinting that maybe with Blofeld dead, like, Bond just doesn't feel like he has a role anymore. I, I find it weird with that. Again, this film just feels weird on so many levels. I'm almost too cartoony. This is more of a comedy, more more comedy than an actual spy film. Bond later makes his way to Amsterdam after the authorities have taken have arrested Peter Franks, and Money Penny makes a surprising scene as she's not in the office, but comes to Bond to a comes to Bond and gives him the passport and essentially takes over Frank's identity. He then makes his way to uh, an apartment in Amsterdam where he meets Tiffany Case. And here she's presented as a strong, very intelligent and independent woman. And she'll say John is always changing with changing wigs and she's seen as a competent person. And it's clear that she's a member of the diamond smuggling operation. And Mr. Wint and Mr. Kiff have yet again killed off another member in the smuggling operation. And just as this is happening, 
1 calls up Q, well, uh, calls up Q, just as he's taking off these false fingerprints that he had on his thumb. No, to make sure that people really do buy that he is Peter Franks, because they would have his, they would, may have never seen him, but they would have his fingerprints on record. A very smart and really ingenious thing by Q, and I really wish in more modern films they could take that gadget. It's, but Bond gets the worst news when he hears that Peter Fanks has escaped and killed two guards and is on his way. Realizing this, Bond has to find a way to prevent him from getting to Tiffany and having his cover blown. As soon as Franks gets there, the two get into a fight in an elevator, but not before one of the most, two of the most weirdest and even stupidest thing ever filmed in a Bond film is shown. Bond pretending to make out with someone, when really he's just making out with himself, and believe it or not, that's just the least silly thing about this movie, and having a very awful false accent. Though I, I will admit, the idea of Bond having a different accent, or pretending to have one, is interesting, and I wouldn't mind that in modern film, but it really had to be that, just felt so out of character. But then of course the fight scene kicks off in the elevator, and I will admit, unlike the fight scene between Bond and Blofeld, the opening of the movie, which I felt was poorly choreographed and poorly edited, this one actually has some genuine suspense and really right on the edge of his seat. And Bond wins in his usual way. And just as he does that, he quickly switches photo, like, identity, like, photo ID to make sure that no one knows who he is. And it's revealed that he switched, take, took Peter Frank's identity and switched it with his Playboy membership. Then Tiffany says one of the most eye-rolling things I've ever heard. You just killed James Bond. And it, imbi and it implicates everyone knows who he is around the world. Yet he's supposed to be a secret agent. Add that, it was meant to be a gag, a gag, but it just fell flat for me. After this, they realized they needed to get the diamonds quickly out with Bond, with, these po with Peter Franks, who they think is Bond, dead. And as a result, they use Peter Franks' corpse to smuggle the diamonds out, saying that that the corpse is actually Peter Franks's well, Bond, who is Peter Franks's brother, and take him to you know, and take him over, you know, take him to essentially put him to rest. And in and during this whole scene, of it turn, and during this whole scene, it turns out that Mr. Winter and Mr. Kid, who are now on the plane, are now following them, indicating one of them is going to die. As they get to, as they reach their destination at an airport, they are then, Bond is then intercepted by Peter, Fra uh, by, I'm uh, not Peter Franks, Felix Leiter. And like I said, in the casting, it just feels terribly miscast, and you don't really have some camaraderie, the more bureaucrat, almost FBI feel to this guy. Bond is then taken, along with Peter Franks, is corpse by a bunch of gangsters, and it's a pretty funny car ride, I must admit. Overall, they then get to um, a funeral home where Peter Franks, his corpse, is burnt alive, and they is cremated, and the thug and the you know the bad guys now have the diamonds. With that out of the way, Mr. Where Mr. Kid knocked out Bond, put him in a in the coffin, and tend to burn him alive. But that's a pretty gruesome way to kill Bond I've ever seen. But it's also no way Bond could get himself out of it. So I was generally surprised how they were going to get out. And Mr. Wind Mr. Kid do the usual funny lines. I really do like Mr. Wind Mr. Kid. They're really funny villains, funny henchmen. And like I said, this film may be terrible for me, but at least some of the supporting characters make it tolerable. After this, Bond does then escape because the diamond that he reveals has been given to the bad guys are fakes, realizing they need Bond alive to find these supposedly real diamonds. It turns out Felix has them, and they and it's clear they plan to do a sting operation to get him. He stay and Bond is staying at the White House, not the little White House, but a hotel casino called the White House, owned by Willard White. And during this, it's Bond gets to walk around the casino, but it feels bad. Like the like the environment is just weird. As Bond's in Vegas, it just doesn't feel right to be Bond be in Vegas at all for me. It doesn't feel that grand of an adventure. Then again, the idea was Bond to be in America because Goldfinger was really set in America, and the idea was for 
it to be just as big and bad as Goldfinger. Overall, this scene is just weird. We get to see Shady Tree, a comedian who was at the Sam, who was at the um funeral house, a funeral home, I should say, doing a stand up, and it's not really that funny. And he also gets killed by Mr. Win by Mr. Wim, Mr. Kid, but turns out he wasn't, since they didn't get the real diamond. And Bert Saxby, the ma well, at least the manager, is also in on the scheme and takes orders from the big guy. And it turns out Willard White is running the show. Here Bond runs into Plenty O2, which is a really fun and nice scene. And there's that scene where they go, and this is followed by them going to Bond's hotel room, where all the gangsters showed up, the one that took Bond to the funeral home, and throw her out the window, window, and she lands in a pool. I do like the little quip where Bond says an excellently fine shot, and one of the gangsters goes, I didn't know there was a pool down there. I generally did get a chuckle out of that line. And all the gangsters then leave, and Bond has a moment with Tiffany Case, who is revealed to be there, and is obviously there to coax some information as to where the diamonds are. Now the whole scene, it's and then of course it's impl and of course it's definitely implicated they've did the deed, but it's just so poorly edited and done wrong. After that, there is a sting, you know, for you know. <laughs> The sting has taken place at a circus casino, a very bizarre thing to be shown in a Bond film, and it's just weird. Tiffany Case eventually escapes with the with the package where the diamonds are, <clears throat> and this is where so something just is shown out of play. We go to Tiffany Case's house, or where she's been staying, and find Plenty O'Toole's body in the water. We don't know how the hell Tiff, uh, Plenty got there, but Bond tells her that, she, that Plenty came looking for her, but and the killers killed her, thinking that was Tiffany Case. It should be then revealed that in a deleted scene, while Bond and Tiffany were doing the deed, Plenty went into the into the the hotel room and went through Tiffany Case's purse and found her address. But that deleted was seen from deleted. That scene was deleted from the film. And Bond does show a bit of his true colors, where Tiffany realized that he's not Peter Franks. Something's odd, but she's definitely not a proper cop. But Bond did intimidate her to spill. And as a result of that, we then see that the package that, or at least the thing Tiffany took from the sting, which was you know the diamonds are then taken to a research facility owned by Willard White, again implicating that he is truly the main villain of the film. Where we get to, then this, then the scene just goes weird, where Bond goes undercover in the facility, pretending to be a scientist, and finds out that these diamonds are made to create some kind of device. And here he runs into Dr. Metz. Eventually his cover is blown, and he ends up escaping the facility in a doom buggy. It is a very weird poorly choreographed and overall just silly, 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 silly scene. Of course, Bond quickly does escape along with Tiffany and goes back to Las Vegas where they then are getting chased by cops on the Las Vegas Strip. Bond of course wins and there is and it there is this very weird stunt where Bond goes through one side, like through this narrow escape and turns the car one side. But then some weird editing, it is then revealed in the bond that weird editing, it then comes out on a different side. It is weird and just poorly done. After that, Bond is now back in the in some kind in a suite now at the White House. And it turns out that he and Felix uh, and Felix comes saying that you know they can't go and arrest Will of White because he has influential friends. But Bond, not wanting to really follow Felix's orders, he then secretly escapes his room and goes up to the top of the White, uh, the White House, uh, you know, the, the hotel room, you know, the, the hotel that is called the White House, and 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 thinks he's going to see Willard White, and he even hears Willard White's voice on the amp on the speakers, knowing that he's here. As he gets into, and just as he gets in, he is then shocked that the will that the supposed Willard White. Who was 
who you thought would be the main villain of the movie, is actually Blofeld. Now, the idea of who you think the main villain is turning out to be Blofeld is a really good twist. However, it was not done right, and it's not that great when you consider that Charles Gray is playing Blofeld. And it turns out that there are some dupes that he has a duplicate. And it's then revealed that Bo that the the person the Blofeld that Bond thought he killed was actually a duplicate, which you think about it would make sense. And it's also revealed that Blofeld has taken over Willard White's entire like business empire and is using it as a front for another for another criminal caper, using all the resources Willard White has. But we are not fully revealed what the plan is and how, what does diamond smuggling have to do with it. And also revealed that Willard White is really alive as being whole captured. Also like how, uh, but however, I want to point out this scene does have something I like about it. How when Bond goes to kill, he kills one of the duplicates, thinking the one he killed was the real Blofeld, but actually killed a duplicate. And the whole conversation between them, he is then taken into an elevator and is gassed and is taken by Mr. Wim, Mr. Kid, who do a nice little funny line. He's taken into a car and put in a car and is essentially weirdly placed in a t in this construction site. In a, I can't exactly explain what it is, but basically when he properly wakes up, he is in some kind of underground, he's basically in this pipeline that is underground. And it's just weird how, why didn't they just kill him? Another thing I also really um, would have found it to seem been interesting if Bond actually did kill the real Blofeld and the phono, phony one, you know, took over and said he was, you know, took over. I would have found that would be really interesting to find out that this guy is far more deadlier than the real Blofeld, making his backstory even more of a mystery. And it just feels weird, the... Bond gets out of it, of course, in a very funny, uh, out of it, and does have a few funny lines, and they then trick Blofeld, was well, trick Blofeld with a device used to mimic Bert Saxby's voice, to say that Blof just um to trick Blofeld into finding out where Willard White's location is. Here, Bond then goes to Willard White, where Willard White's being held, at his um house outside the city, where he then goes up. And gets into a fight with two girls named Bambi and Thumper. Yeah, those lines should definitely make you think. Well, the names. And the fight is definitely really interesting, I will admit. How Bond is pretty much getting his ass handed to him. But he does, you know, get, you know, does win in a very unique, in a very interesting way. And manages to coax him into information to where Willow White is. Here we get to see the actual Willow White in person, and he becomes a pretty likable character. It is then revealed that Bert Saxby is there and tries to do a kill shot at Mr. White, but misses, and instead, Bert gets gunned down. With that, Blofeld has immediately escaped the hotel and is immediately, you know, going to his hideout, but not before he takes kidnapped Tiffany, but it's done weirdly. As he is essentially, Blofeld isn't disguised by being dressed in drag. And it's a weird scene. It's just, it's just weird. And something that can't be unseen. We then find out, and we then find out that what he's been up to. As they get to the research facility that Bond had escaped, turns out that the whole thing was used to build a satellite, which was meant to go up into space and fire a laser and essentially he plans to hold the world, not well, not to hold the world ransom, but it's actually to, uh, well, ransom, and the ransom is to an international auction with nuclear supremacy going to the highest bidder. A very weird plot, but surprisingly something I find really interesting. Also realizing now Blofeld has gone deeper into hiding, now that his cover's blown, they need to find out where he is. And here's is what I like about Willard White. It's clear that he is a businessman. He does, he knows everything about his business inside and out. But he's also a pretty likable guy, a very fun character, thanks to uh, Jimmy's performance. Um, and just the whole, and basically how he has influential friends with the government and is clearly wants to help. 
We then, and he also has some pretty funny lines. But here we find out where Blofeld is hiding because, um, because like he said, Bond said, with his empire as a cover, he could be hiding anywhere. But he's, and he says possibly Baja, California. But Willard says Baja. That can't be. I don't anything at Baja. Realizing that Blofeld, Blofeld must have opened this up while Willard White was gone, there must be some logical reason. They go to Baja, which is like this oil station out in the ocean, and it's a very poor villain layer set design. It is bad. But that just goes just how much of less of a budget they have for this film, courtesy of Sean Connery's salary, and couldn't come up with anything better. And also, I just don't get what, why this, how this, this is the last, the climax of the film is very underwhelmed, because this is what happens. Both, uh, uh, Bond gets to the oil rig, the, the, the oil the oil rig. He then gets in, but he's caught, where he meets, and Tiff and we get to see Tiffany Kay's sunbathing. Not complaining about that bit though. Um, we then, he then of course meddles with the machine by putting in a different cassette tape and taking the real one out and giving it to Tiffany. Only Tiffany doesn't know what happened and thinking that Bond was telling her to put that in the machine, and realizing that she made a mistake when she revealed what she did, it's just realizing that now everything's gone wrong, and Bo and basically, Bond has been told, uh, tell, Blofeld tells his guys to lock Bond away. And just as this is happening, Tiffany is reached, trying to put the new cassette in, but is caught, and Charles Gray does give off a nice little line. And just as this is happening, Willard White, Felix, and all the CIA come in in helicopters and bomb the facility and try to, you know, destroy the facility. Now, I must admit, I do love that Willard White is participating and is flying a helicopter. Again, the character is definitely inspired by real, you know, American businessmen tycoons. Probably after Howard Hughes, I would say. And just as this, Bond gets out of his cell and quickly gets up top and just as this is happening we just as this is happening is then revealed that Blofeld plans to aim his laser at Washington DC as another ultimatum to speed up the process of people accepting his ransom but just as he realized that the ship's gonna go down he quickly get he quickly plans his escape but Bond intervenes and essentially, it's a really silly, goofy scene where Bond uses a crane to pick up his escape vehicle, which essentially has a battle sub, and runs it left to right into the main facility where Mertz is, and essentially blows up the control station. Both Bond and Tiffany then jump off the rig just as the whole thing explodes. It's a really just poorly done fight climax. It has none of the glamour like Goldfinger had. And it's just, and I just find this film how it turned out because it is directed by the guy who made Goldfinger. Overall, it's just done so weirdly. And the special effects of blowing stuff up, you know, the laser did and the helicopters, it's just bad. Of course, the scene would, of course, the film then would close, would slowly close with Bond and Tiffany on a cruise to go back to London. And we get to see Felix and Bond now, Felix and Willard White saying their goodbyes. And I really just like the last line. And of course, White is such a likable guy. He says, if you want, tell the captain to have the thing go around in circles. In other words, so that the cruise will take longer to get back to London. Again, just showing just how nice of a guy Willard White is. But the film is not over yet. Mr. Went and Mr. Kid are still alive. And as a result, we get a very mediocre final fight with them, but something that Guy Hamilton would do for his last three Bond films, where the henchman is technically not dead yet, and has one final crack at Bond. This time, it's on a cruise ship. And um, the film ends with Bond and Tiffany looking up to the stars, finding out how the hell they're going to get those diamonds back. And the film ends with Bond saying, Bond will return in Live and Let Die. This whole film is just bad. It's poorly written, and it's just bad with the set designs not even at all captivating. Sean Connery's return also feels very bad, as it's just poor. The whole film is just bad, and this was a really bad way to kick off the 70s. 
and the franchise was really in desperate need of renewal after this. I guess the magic that the Connery had to making his Bond was just stale and clearly something that just wouldn't work for the 70s. Blofeld, although I will admit the, the betrayal of him in the third installment being campy is something I really have grown to like over time. The actor who played him, I felt, was terribly miscast. What they could have done was honestly just brought Donald Pleasance back. They should have just done that. And I'm puzzled to why that didn't happen. If he didn't want to make it on Majesty's Secret Service didn't exist, they could have just done that. Brought back that and he could have made it. It's a, content, it's a continuation of the end of Your Only Live Twice. Um, Tiffany K started out as a good Bond girl, but by the end of the film she became just a bumbling bimbo. Mr. Wit and Mr. Kid are really fun and entertainable henchmen, and Willard White and Plenty of Two are nice supporting characters. The other main supporting characters are kind of bland and not at all interesting, and it's just, this film is just a bit of a drag and a bit of a disappointment. Especially when following on, on Her Majesty's, you could have had a good revenge story, but instead you're trying to remake the magic of Goldfinger. Which, honestly, that should have not been the case i like how the previous the films that follow goldfinger you don't try to recreate the magic you do something different that and that way you could have your own story this just feels so bland and it just didn't work for me this film is something now honestly the sixth all the film bond films that were made by eon in the 60s is something i highly recommend people watch this one is the first film in this series i recommend you skip well, if you're interested, give it a watch, but it's just bad for me. I don't, and I just don't get it. It's, it's too campy for my liking, but, and to be honest, what makes it worse is that Connery, it just doesn't work with Connery's bond, campiness. It would with Roger Moore's down the line when he took over the role, but it just doesn't. It just doesn't work for me. Of course, the film was a hit at the box office, but was mixed with the critics, and people were saying that Bond could not keep up with the changing times. And with Connery refusing to come back for another film, saying that he would never again come back to the role of James Bond, they realised that the best thing to do in order to save the franchise was to give it a reboot and take another dive. But this film still showed that Bond is still around, even though it is bad. And I'm not blaming the guys who made this film as i think it could the real root to the cause of why this film didn't do well is really with connery not saying the guy is bad but his salary like salary and how much he'd ask just to come back and most of that and as a result of that it was strained on the budget and as a result we could have got more lavish sets and far more interesting climax with bond and blofeld it just feels bland overall i don't recommend you watch it I say skip it, but if you're curious, give it, I, I guess, if you're curious, give it a look. But it's a film I just don't recommend you watch. And there we have it, Diamonds Are Forever. What, one of, I consider this one of the worst Bond films ever, even the fact it has Connery in it. It is just bad from start to finish. Though there are some great supporting characters that I do find tolerable, that make the film tolerable, and... Jill St. John is an okay Bond girl. She starts off great, but her characterization just went in the wrong way. And, yeah. So join me next time as we review another, the, the, the Bond film to follow this one. And that is 1973's Live and Let Die. And so until next time, this has been The Hour. The Stephen Hour. And so long for now.